What's up, everybody? Welcome to IGN Game Soup. I am your host, Damon Hatfield. Joining me this week is Tina Amini. What's up, everybody? Sam Claiborne. Hey, everybody. And Justin Davis. Scoop. And we have a great show for you this week. Big, big show for you this week. We're going to talk about games we're playing, such as Super Mario 3D All-Stars and Hades. We're going to have a light discussion on what the best and worst looking consoles of all time are. But first, the biggest news of the week. In the, in the words of IGN's own Ryan McCaffrey, the biggest news of the last five years. Surely you heard wow. about this already. Microsoft is buying Bethesda for seven and a half billion dollars. Quite a bit more than Disney paid for Star Wars, which now makes Xbox the home of popular video game franchises like Fallout, Elder Scrolls, Doom, Wolfenstein, Quake, the upcoming Starfield. Uh, I don't think the mascot now. What's that? Who's Microsoft's mascot now? (laughs) I mean, Ryan also pointed out that like now Elder Scrolls is like probably Microsoft's biggest. Like franchise, yeah. not is Halo. Sky- <laughs> is Skyrim guy like there? Is that the face of Microsoft? Now? <laughs> yeah, he's their new CEO. Is yeah. what about Doom guy? Because Doom guy just looks exactly like Master Chief. <laughs> yeah, Actually, yeah, maybe it's true. just like three tier slices of of each of them, including Master Chief. <laughs> Why not? It looks the same. It's anyway. an amalgamation. <laughs> uh, man, I don't think we can overstate how big a deal this is. Uh, Tina, what sort of? Uh, once you start us out, what was your, what was your reaction upon hearing this news? Well, first off, 7.5 billion is is a big part of it too. It's obviously big news for Microsoft because, or rather for Xbox, because they're getting all of these titles. And another thing that McCaffrey pointed out was that it's basically now the home destination for Western RPGs, mm-hmm. which is just a huge swath of incredible I mean, potential games. Yeah, as you were already pointing out, they already um, had Obsidian, right? Yeah, exactly. And and they would have Fable coming into uh, newly onto the Xbox Series X S mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and all of that. Um, but yeah, just the, the amount of money that went into it is also huge. Uh, and, and it's like monopoly money. I can't even consider that amount of money, really. Um, mm-hmm. It's also, I think, more than double what they paid for Minecraft as well, which is Whoa. a pretty impressive comparison. I think that's Minecraft amazing. Like two point something billion, um, but uh, n- still nowhere near what they paid for ZeniMax and, and all of the studios that came with it. But it sounds like it's not going to be exactly... Uh, an equivalent nature with some of their other studios just because of the publishing nature around Bethesda too. But regardless, it's whatever way it goes, this is a positive uh, piece of news for for Xbox and for the upcoming generation of consoles for them. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Bethesda themselves being a roll-up means that, uh, you know, they're not, they didn't just buy Bethesda, right? Like they're buying Arcane and they're buying um, id and yeah. you know multiple game development so crazy. Studios where i'm not even sure i'm not even sure where they, where how many continents they're on but um it's a lot and like i don't know how big um elder scrolls online is but it's not a small mmo so presumably that game you know is generating a profit month after month so mm-hmm. crazy news yeah, yeah Borba says yes, 2.5 2.5 from minecraft borba says so mm-hmm. this is three times three times um, yeah <laughs> the, the uh, uh the fact that like we were talking about uh, Microsoft maybe buying Warner Brothers this summer too, yeah. and I don't know. Like now, now that that this is out, I don't, I don't know if that'll happen or if it's more or less likely to happen. But like I was thinking, you know, that's that would be super amazing for them to have Batman games, and that be like their big, you know, their that's their big coup. This is so much bigger. It's just, it's just, it's the games <laughs> I'm looking forward to the most. They now own. It's crazy. It's so much bigger. And I think, you know, $7 billion is like big boy money. Like that is more than I have a theory that sometimes people hear big numbers and then, you know, their mind just like glazes over it. It's like, that's so much more money than like a hundred million dollars or like $400 million. Like that absolutely went all the way up to the Microsoft board of directors, the CEO, like it shows how serious, like it's gotta be, it's gotta be one of Microsoft's biggest acquisitions ever for the company period let alone xbox what about um, skype? <laughs> yeah like it's like that and skype exactly they boned uh, that one they did bone that one <laughs> um we should say i don't think you know they're sort of being a little coy on whether those games are going to be exclusive so you know That's, damon you you yeah. called it the home of elder scrolls i'm like well you know maybe like they're leaving that a little well, open-ended for now well i mean the home of elder scrolls just in, in the fact that you know microsoft owns elder scrolls now <laughs> they may they may choose to share these games with other platforms um but that is r- the real big question about this right like are these future bethesda games going to be on playstation 5 mm-hmm. yeah um, like 
Phil Spencer's line uh, once upon a time in a quote that he'd given um, was gaming is bigger than any one device. So I'm super curious if he's actually going to maintain that um, for that philosophy moving forward with Bethesda games, uh, because either way, like they still get a cut of the sales. So if you have more install bases on other consoles, for instance, and keep it not exclusive, they still will get that portion of sales coming in uh, to recoup their $7.5 billion at some point of time. But if they keep it exclusive and go that model, which honestly seems to be the thing that gamers care more about, um, that's obviously a boon in in that direction too. But they run the risk of going contrary to some of their philosophy that they've mentioned before, including leading up to a lot of the marketing materials for the Xbox Series X and S. I think that would go against the subscription model that they're really playing up now too, because I think they really, really now want people to come to their ecosystem, which is PC and Xbox, it's not just Xbox, to play uh, to play their exclusive games. And they didn't have any. Like, now they do. It, it's just like, it's it was such a missing part of that puzzle for me. And it was puzzling that they were pushing that um, it, with Halo out of the way of the launch and stuff like that. Like, this is such a coup for them if they're going to really want people to pay 10 bucks a month. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, the, the timing of the announcement, you know, 24 hours before pre-orders went live, uh, you know, since they lost Halo, there was a really big uh, question mark on what, why do I need to pre-order this this mm-hmm. console right now? And then this, but this news is like, oof, yeah, makes it much more appealing. I mean, they, you know, Microsoft is not really in the business of selling video games anymore. They want everyone subscribed to Game Pass. It's such an overwhelmingly better deal than buying games as a one-off that, like. There's an argument, and I was I was talking about this on social media, where maybe they put the games on PS5 at seventy dollars just to make Game Pass look like now once a year when a Bethesda game comes out, they say you can get it on Game Pass for free, or I guess you could buy it on PS5 for seventy bucks. Like mm-hmm. it's an opportunity to just you know make money on that platform and then just you know market and advertise their own service over and over again over the course of this generation. Um, and then, you know, they can do cutesy stuff at E3 by being like, we'd be happy to have Game Pass on PS5 <laughs> if, if Sony would allow it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> E3 is going to be different, huh? They're not going to have a Bethesda conference, but Microsoft conference will be really exciting now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. My prediction, I do think that there's a possibility that they release those games at full price on PS5 and then they're free on Xbox. But um you don't spend seven billion dollars to do that, in my opinion. I think that those games, like Xbox, is getting waxed this fall in terms of software. They don't have any games, um, and so treating them as a first-party studio and making those games exclusive. If I'm forced to pick, I think that that's what they're most likely to do. To go back to the um, Game Pass example, I pulled up McCaffrey's article just because it's very thorough, and I want to quote him on one area. He says, regardless of whether or not Microsoft chooses to keep future Bethesda games off of PlayStation 5, the fact of the matter is that the following mega franchises will now see all future entries launch day and date into Game Pass. Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Starfield, Doom, Wolfenstein, Quake, etc. That's on top of the Halos, Fables, Avows, etc. that are already on the way. If it wasn't already, Game Pass is now a required $10 a month expense for all serious gamers because the value in return for that $120 per year is through the roof. It's mm-hmm. a pretty good argument. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I pre-ordered both a PlayStation 5 and an Xbox Series X uh, from Amazon. And of course, they don't charge until they ship. So like in my mind, I'm sort of just sort of playing a waiting game. Like, would I would I cancel one or the other? And, I, you know, I always thinking, well, if I did cancel one, it would be the Xbox Series X. But now, man, I'm just thinking, oof, I don't know. Xbox mm-hmm. sounds so appealing right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm worried uh, because the last big acquisition of a Western RPG developer uh, that I can think of did not go well, and that was EA's uh, acquisition of Bioware. And uh, you know, Mass Effect was my favorite series, and it didn't it didn't end up very well. But mm-hmm. I think EA gets a lot of blame for that. But um, I hope that there's just like you know, don't touch that development process. Do what you're going to do with publishing it and putting it out. And I hope it just is going great over there. And this is just all good news for them. Yeah, well, the fact that well, you guys go. I was the, 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 we did have Microsoft actually buying Obsidian mm-hmm. recently. Yeah. It's another big you know Western mm-hmm. RPG maker acquisition yeah. where you know it hasn't been enough time to really see whether that's working out smoothly or not. But like you know, fingers crossed, and so far so good over there. <laughs> and it brings the makers of the good Fallout you know back <laughs> that's in, so true back into the fold of like now you know microsoft owns all of it so yeah. if they're not if they're not already you know you can absolutely see you know obsidian hard at work on a new you know fallout new vegas 2 or whatever city they want to take it to um i i'm super confident we're going to see that um 
because because Bethesda is not planning a Fallout, right? Like it's not in their roadmap. They're doing Starfield and then Elder Scrolls, and so you know. But now they have Obsidian in house too, so it's like I feel like the puzzle pieces are falling together. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and Phil Spencer and Pete Hines's, um, you know, press releasey statements uh, around the purchase seem to say that there was going to be some sort of independence involved, um, both in terms of the publishing thing that I mentioned earlier, um, but just in terms of like the the philosophy around like they're honoring the upcoming PS5 exclusives that they already have within that deal. So I think there's a lot of flexibility that they're affording them, and it's more about yes, they're bringing them into the Xbox family, but not necessarily, you know, suddenly changing the complete work culture and ethics that they have around development. So hopefully not a, you know, Bioware EA thing, regardless of what went down there. Yeah, true. This um, is on the heels of so many other company acquisitions, you know, whatever that the, the dozen were. And of course, Obsidian was a big one, but um, it's really mm-hmm. cool to think of, you know, uh, this happening right now with a lot of Western companies under Microsoft and it's just a very they're a very different setup now with lots of huge bit major games coming out than Sony or Nintendo. They're just it's just so different and um yeah, they're being competitive. They're not they're not bowing out. I mean, it's, who's who's left? Like there's been so much consolidation. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Ubisoft may be too big, but like, you know, like the, a lot like, you know, Capcom, Sega, a lot of Japanese companies. Um, how happy are they that Bethesda was bought for $7 billion? Like if they, if they had any interest in, in like cashing out, you know, like it's going to be a really interesting There's, year. There are rumors about Microsoft buying Sega as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there always are. I, I don't know. how. My money's on are. Capcom. Oh, or that would be Xbox's really. Xbox's money's on Capcom, eh? That'd be really good, and Capcom <laughs> could go internal on Sony too. Uh, for Sega, that'd be really uh, appropriate because Microsoft built the inside of the the Dreamcast. Yeah, they've had a close collab. I think yeah. that's where those rumors come from. Is they've you know been sort of brothers in arms for a long time over the decades. Um. Yeah, and then there's um uh the the executive whose name escapes me, who is at both Sega and Microsoft. Uh, what Bernie Stoller is that right? No, 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 no. I don't. I don't know. It was just. You, are you talking about back in the nineties? Uh, well, ninety nine launching the Dreamcast. Okay. Um, you, know, you know who it is? Is his it son, Tom Kalinske? His son worked at IGN. Oh. Who am I thinking of? <laughs> who am I thinking of? Yeah, he uh, had the Halo, the Halo Two tattoo on his arm, and now he runs a soccer. I can yeah, picture his face, yeah. but the name is just not right there. I didn't know somebody like this worked at IGN. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, <a> Googling break. <laughs> uh, 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 Are you gonna make it show up on your hat? No, that's not a bad but idea. It's I... a good reveal. Yeah, can you do twenty questions reveals on your hat? Yeah, uh, I've thought about doing that. I've thought and about the answer is just yes or no. <laughs> I mean, you suck. You're great. Peter Moore. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh my god. Oh, yeah. Peter Moore. Yes. Oh yeah, I remember. Jeez. Yeah, I remember that now. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, you know another big a really strong uh buyout candidate would be would be Square Enix. <laughs> no kidding. Well, what, Again, like, what, though, didn't Sony pick this stuff up? But like yeah, Square like, Enix is interesting because of that mix of East versus West, right? So you yeah. get Deus Ex with IDOS and Tomb Raider, and you get Final Fantasy and mm-hmm. um, Dragon Quest. Like I man, mean, Square Enix themselves has expanded that way, right? They're just yeah. they, they've They've taken on taken on a different role in the game industry. That's got to be if we were to see if we were to see you know some ten billion dollar acquisition this year, I would say it'd be them. Mm-hmm. Well, you think Square Enix would go for more than Bethesda? Oh, I don't know. I'm just saying, like another multi billion dollar thing. Like they're they're a really credible candidate. It's just my gut check. And be, I don't um, think they would go for more than Bethesda. Final Fantasy though, Final Fantasy and Drockway. And Drakway. Yeah. See, that's the thing is that they have the <laughs> Japanese business for Drakway, and that would be crazy. And by by the way, everybody, that is a real thing. People actually say Drakway for Dragon Quest. I don't, I only I don't say know. Dragon According Warrior. to Jared Petty. I was just no, going to no, say the only true. person I've ever people, heard. No, 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 no. I have always backed him up on that. I've, I've heard people say it. And he's going to chime in, too. Every time we bring up Jared on this show, he writes, he writes me personally, and then uh, usually tweets at us. So, hi, Jared. Um, CJ anyway. too, by the way. Hi, CJ. He's in person <laughs> yeah. that contacts us. CJ does still watch the show. Yep. Um, oh, wait, so I, I'm a little uh, uh, unclear on Sam on whether you whether or not you think Xbox will keep 
future Bethesda games exclusive to Xbox and PC and off PlayStation. Uh, I have to make the prediction. I'm just um, curious. I think it would be so smart for them to make that their big exclusive uh, Halo-like thing and just keep it keep it to themselves. I think yeah. th- there's a reason that game exclusives still exist in general, even though we're mad about it. And it's that it's to sell it's to sell software, and uh, the hardware is just a means of getting that software to to people. You just I mean, touched I, on something yeah. that I find so interesting about the psychology of all this, like the backroom dealing when one company pays another to make a game exclusive feels horrible right like it feels anti-consumer and like ah oh, you're just money changing hands to make this game only for one console but then if you buy the whole company then it's like it's like well okay <laughs> like you bought the house so i guess you get to get the games for free now like <laughs> it's just an interesting twist and in, like no one seems to be as mad about that as they are when you know when square is paid to make final fantasy for only one console I don't even know if people are necessarily all that mad about it because the thing that people rave about when they say like, oh yeah, I'm buying PS5 hands down. Why? Because of the exclusives. And I'm I'm proud to own the machine that will run the, the best games and it's better than Xbox. Like that seems to be the big selling point. So I wonder if like, you know, there's, well, I guess there's probably two different camps of people in that case. Yeah. There's the camp of people that now are like, I've just, you know, pre-ordered a $500 PlayStation, I might not be able to play Elder Scrolls on it. That, like that's that would that would make me mad because that's the point of exclusives. But they didn't know that going into their console purchase, which is yeah. you know a little bit unfortunate timing wise. Well, I we suppose are, that's why it came a day before pre-orders were announced. Or well, yeah, and, and it's good news; it was impossible to get either system. So <laughs> I mean, technically, you can <laughs> so still really make it. So it was fair games. at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, is that your segue? Um, we are we are regressing though, right? Like th- you know, there's always been exclusives, right? Like a Sony made game or an Xbox made game, but like for the most part, third party exclusives kind of died down. It was only those first party games. So you know, you buy a Nintendo platform for Nintendo games, but like now we're kind of moving the opposite direction. Like if these games are exclusive on Xbox, you know, but all of Final Fantasy and all the first party Sony stuff is on PlayStation, like you kind of got to buy both again. Like you can't really get away with one or the other hmm. kind of feels bad. It's insane. No other industry works this way. <laughs> um, you know, like just movies and everything else are not agnostic, you know, are not specific to one platform. They're agnostic. Yeah. So feel, Mon- feels bad. Hunter just got locked into switch for two future games. It makes that it was- a very expensive, a hobby. That's hard to, uh, feels like it's going to be hard to grow. I feel like Xbox might take a slower path and maybe do what Sony often does, which is do like timed um, exclusives. So you get this game first on this platform. You get this game. If you're a Game Pass subscriber, you get this game first um, and free essentially with a subscription model uh, on the Xbox Series X instead. And then like opens up a month later for PS5. I could see yeah. that happening. So they maintain their philosophy, but also take advantage of the exclusivity too. Yeah, and that means that then then you can, in terms of the the wallet proposition that Justin just brought up, then you really could consider like having, which subscriptions are you subscribing to for games, and that's what that's what Microsoft's trying to get a jump on. They want you to be there first, and if you're only paying ten bucks a month for those exclusives, that's a lot better than having to buy them on uh, Xbox, and while you're also having to buy Spider Man games on your PlayStation. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a big backlash when. Xbox uh, uh, got Rise of the Tomb Raider exclusively. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I guess um, this is different. And in that case, Microsoft was, you know, uh, this is like years ago before they sort of were able to turn things around for the Xbox One. So everyone was like super down on Xbox and Rise of the Tomb Raider wasn't going to be something that was going to like make every PlayStation or think, oh my God, I have to go out and buy an Xbox now to totally. play Rise of the Tomb Raider. So, but I guess... Hey. Buying all of Bethesda could do the trick. Wasn't Oblivion uh, an Xbox 360 exclusive, at least timed-wise? I, th- I only associated well, <laughs> that with a 360 and a PC. Yes, uh, yes, because the Xbox 360 was out a full year before PS3. So it, then it was out on the PS3 eventually. Or wh- whatever the case. I don't I just know read, that for sure. But. That was the first time that I really associated Elder Scrolls yeah. with Xbox. Yeah. And then that got reset by Skyrim because that was just everywhere. Well, yeah, Skyrim was multi-platform, but the PS3 version was deeply, deeply flawed too, right? Like it was like, yeah. don't play that game on <laughs> PS3 if you don't really? have to. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Even was... compared to the famously flawed other versions. <laughs> That's crazy. yeah. Well, yeah, it was the PS3 version yeah. was really unstable. Huh. Well, maybe that was the start of their uh, happy relationship. We just we should have seen it coming, apparently. 
Uh, we got lots of emails about this topic this week, so let's go ahead and check in with the listeners. Hey, listeners. Listeners, Howdy, you can listener. always reach us at the email address, gamescoop at IGN.com, just like Jared Cust in Sydney, Australia did. And he says, thank you for your wonderful weekly podcast. Sam, please build your Lego NES. There is a wonderful Easter egg during the build that will hit you right in the nostalgia. I read about the Easter egg, so I don't have to open the box. Okay. Uh, Jared says, I am an Xbox gamer, but I wouldn't consider myself a fanboy. I 100% agree that PlayStation currently has an industry lead on both players and quality first-party games. My console preference for Microsoft is mostly due to the linked ecosystem of Microsoft and Xbox accounts. With the recent exciting Microsoft acquisition of ZeniMax Media, it seems that the gaming world has been rocked by a megaton bombshell regarding fears of future release exclusivity, either timed or permanent. Thankfully, Phil Spencer has already been quite vocal regarding Microsoft's inclusive philosophy, so hopefully we'll see a future Bethesda games released also on platforms other than Xbox. This acquisition is a huge advantage for Xbox. So the question remains, aside from Game Pass, how does Microsoft plan to use its new Bethesda gaming properties to sell more consoles? Below are a couple questions I would like to explore outside of the discussion that is dominated by fear of direct exclusivity. Number one, Bethesda games are usually quite DLC heavy. So would it be unreasonable for Xbox to receive exclusivity regarding story or cosmetic DLC packs, timed or permanent outside of the vanilla game? Sure, that seems very possible. That seems like a very possible scenario. Yeah, I think you know you're going to see they didn't just buy the games and the development studios; they bought all those brands too, right? So it's like you're going to see a Doom guy skin in the next Gears of War and like all that weird yeah. stuff. They're, yeah, they're gonna I, make... I was thinking about the uh, Smash Brothers version of, of like all mm-hmm. the characters now, like exactly. PlayStation All Stars. What the, now? Microsoft has this crazy, crazy gallery of characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, This other question is a little bit more interesting. It says, the demand for Bethesda games is huge. 30 million copies of Skyrim have been sold across various platforms. Do you think Microsoft would be successful using upcoming titles, such as Elder Scrolls 6, as a bargaining chip to bring PlayStation exclusives like Spider-Man and God of War to Xbox? Oh, like, we'll give you Skyrim if you give us Spider-Man? It's like a prisoner exchange. (laughs) I've never never thought about that happening, and I don't think it, I mean, it's just, uh, it just doesn't even make sense. Like you would have to, yeah, that's hard well, for me to wrap my head around. It's hard to imagine, right? Cause that's Sony, so cool. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's cool to think about, but Sony like, they're like exclusive first party lineup is like, that's what they have. You know, that's yeah. like, yeah, that's the I mean, point like, of exclusivity. Yeah. It also connects back to, you know, micro or Xbox was so much more willing to participate in cross play. And Sony yeah. were the ones who were mm-hmm. kind of hanging behind and, and they were the last ones to, come around to that too because they they're so interested in maintaining their own eco- ecosystem and their own install base um as opposed to microsoft that has this like wider philosophy so i don't know it's a it's a weird negotiation to think about happening um at some sort of like you know conference room table uh, yeah. I can't how do you even being that direct how, how do you even weigh out like what's a, an equivalent like is god of war 2 equivalent to elder scrolls 6 like i don't know <laughs> right yeah I mean, no. no, Elder Scrolls no. is bigger. Yeah, but yeah, is it worth it to? I mean, well, maybe after launch of a game, you can you can weigh that out, right? Yeah, I don't know. I love that idea. It's like Spider Man appearing in the MCU. <clears throat> I got cat cat hair in my mouth now. I'm gonna oh, lean yeah. off camera for a sec. <laughs> that happens. That's a real thing. Uh, in I'm imagining the scenario where Microsoft does put these games on PlayStation for seventy dollars. Do they when you boot them up? Do you get like a Microsoft or an Xbox logo? Apparently, like, yeah, in, won't what, that drive Sony crazy? That's what happens with Minecraft on anything, well, yeah. you know? Yeah, but that was that's like, strange. like until now, that was an isolated incident, right? Yeah, now remember like, Viva yeah. Pinata came out on Nintendo DS? Well, that was a, it's a whole, whole game. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's its own game. Yeah, they've essentially become a force to reckon with, essentially. It is a $7.5 yeah. $7. billion dollar power move. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, as we mentioned, Xbox order, pre-orders did go live earlier this week, and they were also frustrating, just like PS5 pre-orders were last week. I got mine from Amazon. Uh, Tina, did you get an Xbox? Um, so pre-order? someone was so kind enough to secure one for me. She has one coming. <laughs> nice. Uh, Sam, did you get several? Yeah. For work. Uh, yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, I don't know which one to rely on at this point, but it was, it was a shit <laughs> show. And it was really funny because... You know, it's been this way for so many different pre-orders recently. 
um, well, since the beginning of the internet. Uh, but uh, it was exactly the same as the week before, which is what was really funny to me. Like Best Buy site yeah. was down the whole time. Uh, Walmart worked briefly. Uh, Target was really hard to check out the cart. Like it was like they just between one week and the next, like there was barely any change in how they handled the stuff. And, and I guess this means, means it went well on the, on the retailer side. Well, yeah, maybe. Justin, Nothing to you, change. You, like you're, inv- you're involved in like the commerce side of things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how much are, uh, how many people mistakenly bought Xbox One X's? Yeah, we ran a news story about this. Uh, yeah. Matt, Matt Kim worked with our, our commerce editors on it. Uh, the answer is some. Um, so we did we did two things. We looked at how many Xbox One Xs were sold on the Series X pre-order day compared yeah. to the previous, you know, I think it was 60 days. Yeah. And it was there was more sold in that one day than had been sold in the previous 60 days. Um, and then we yeah. also, just to keep ourselves sane and make sure we were comparing apples to apples, we compared PS4 sales on the PS5 pre-order day because just because someone buys a One X, it doesn't necessarily mean that they did it on accident. Maybe they just, you know, they're typing Xbox into into you know Amazon.com and they're like, oh sure, you know, I I want this old console too. Um, yeah. But the answer is zero PS4s were sold on PS5 pre-order day. Yeah, that's if you looked up on on Amazon specifically that morning, that you know Amazon doesn't do you have to like have a direct link to their placeholder page because it doesn't, they don't push it into their search results. So if you look up, you know, Xbox series X that morning, it does just bring up one X for like all the way down. Cause there's all these variations of the one X and uh, you know, that, that just seems like a weird problem. They could avoid, they could just put up a placeholder page. You know why they don't do that? Justin. Um, they, they do, they do put up a placeholder page or but why the, it's not but, results. I mean, but, but people are too, people are too fast. Like the pre-order, like if everything worked normal and it was a product that was widely available, like you, it's just things are happening down to the second and it's not in search results in time. Like they're already sold out and gone by the time it all gets normalized. But they don't want to put that placeholder page in search like a week ahead or anything like that. Mm, I guess what I don't know is Amazon had a, they had a page up and then it goes offline prior to the console going live. Yeah. We see big dogs. Yeah, you see the 404 page uh, for a while as they're flipping the switch, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so I do think, and you know, if Seth Macy were on the show, he is furious about all the stories that were written about, like, haha, so many Xbox One Xs were sold accidentally because look, it jumped up 3,000 places in Amazon's rankings. And it's like, look, that console was still ranked 400th or something on Amazon.com. It was being outsold mm-hmm. by weird keyboards and like mm-hmm. other weird stuff. Like, this is not a story, um, hmm. but it is a number greater than zero. That's what our data showed is a few people did accidentally buy one X's and we did come pretty close to proving that because there were no PS fours purchased on PS five day. For me, yeah. it's like I did, I did go on Amazon that morning, both to, you know, for, for the, for the Xbox and search series X and series S and you did get one X results. And like, I did a double take, you know, cause you got a black box there like that that doesn't mean I'm like, just willy nilly just going to throw my money at it. But I did see, I did like, look, Oh, Whoa. Oh no, that's the one X. You know, I, I think mm-hmm. that is, that's a problem for Microsoft too, but it doesn't seem to be a big one. We, um, one weird quirk about Xbox pre-orders is that one S pre-orders, um, never went live on Amazon. They're still as of this, as of <laughs> us recording this. Really? Yeah. So they um, went live at, I think every other retailer, but never Amazon. Having spent hours with these retailer systems this week, um, I, I, I do, I have uh, like so many questions about how they're set up because a lot of the ways in which you can buy a console when, when everybody's there is that you have to just do the same action over and over again, whether it's like hit a button over and over again, cause something's in your cart and you just need to add your credit card. Like it was crazy. And so we were all in a Slack thread together, giving each other tips. It was like, Oh, if you're stuck in your cart on a uh, target, wait till it has the one in it and then refresh your screen. And at that point you want to go there and just start, start hitting uh, uh checkout, 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 checkout. But if it doesn't have the one don't go there yet. It was just crazy. I wish we could, I wish we could like, like publicly help out everybody to buy systems because we all had to pitch in help each other on that that minute level but i'm so happy that we're able to do it on twitter and on our articles and the way that the commerce team does it i hope you guys all found systems and we helped yeah, i don't think a mess but like why like <laughs> it's uh, apple has figured it out apple sells new phones every year right. and it's not a mess like this right 
Yeah, they they sell a lot more phones. That that's really the only answer um, is just the frenzy because they're not there's not an unlimited supply. Hmm. Plus, don't you well, not necessarily get your new iPhone day and date to to launch all the time, even if you pre order? No, but the people that do want it on on that launch day, I think everyone's able to get one. I mean, uh, I'm surprised to hear that. I thought I thought Apple has first of all they have lines outside their stores. They, uh, you know, and I know that their online process is probably smoother, but like, what what are they doing differently? Is it just supply? As Justin's saying, it must be what it is. I mean, we, I also think people are underestimating, particularly the PS5, how big of a deal that was. Um, I don't really know how much of this data I can share, but I'll, I'll share that it was bigger than Black Friday on IGN, like, Mm -hmm. It, and like, and not, and not like a little bit li- bigger, but actually much, much bigger. And Black um, Friday is a giant event for us. <laughs> yeah, like you know, so just total click volume. Like, there's nothing. You're like, oh, Best Buy is a big multinational corporation. Like, how can they have problems with this? But like, it's really unprecedented. Like, particularly mm-hmm. in the case of the PS5. Like, I think it's much, much, much bigger than the than an iPhone launch than anything that's ever happened before. Like, I guess that doesn't quite explain why it was down all day for <laughs> Xbox as well too. But at least from the data that you know we're exposed to and we can see, um, you know, I, I've certainly never seen anything like it. Hmm. Also, well, it was Borba definitely. Says he, Borba oh, says ahead. he tried to pre-order the iPhone 11 and couldn't, and got it three weeks after um, yeah. its launch date. I also remember having issues like trying to order through Verizon through my um, provider. Yeah, when you have to go through your provider, it's definitely uh, uh, really hard to do. That's I remember doing that. Now that I think about it, if you um. Uh, if you think about like what a scheme could be for this one, one thing you need to cut out is these like these sites, Best Buy banned and GameSpot, bo- uh, uh, GameStop both banned people basically from their sites temporarily because they thought it was a DDoS attack. Like yeah. that, that, that's what the site's reaction. So like that's one thing that you could solve. You could say, listen, if you're going to pre-order PlayStations, you need to have an account with us. And to have an account with us, you need to. And if you want, if you're going to be pre-ordering this, I know this sounds like draconian, a lot of steps, but it would solve this problem. You could make sure that that person has a credit card on file and is is uh, an actual human, and then they're logging in. I mean, there's like things you can do. Like I think the bet they're taking is like, oh, we actually want people to buy. We want we want to make this as free to everybody to buy. But like that's not the problem they need to be solving. The problem they need to be solving is customer service, not like let's make sure we sell all these PS5s. They're going to sell all the PS5s. Yeah. It seems like it was much harder to get a PS5 digital or an Xbox One S. It seems like there's the much uh, more limited supply of those versions of the of, of the consoles, which makes you wonder, like, what's even like, why did they even introduce these? It seems like a half measure. No, I think I have a theory about this, too. Okay. Um, they claimed that it was like, what, 20 percent, like there's 20 percent as many uh, PS4 digitals as there are regulars. PS5, excuse me. Um, yeah. I I don't believe them. Um, I think it's strictly to say. I literally think it's strictly to say that the PS4 starts at three ninety nine. Um, <laughs> I was going to say marketing, but that's an even more specific marketing thing to say. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. So I I think um, I I don't believe for a second actually that there's twenty percent as many uh, PS5 digitals as there are PS5. And you know I'm spouting off like I could totally be wrong, but just based off the data that we have, again it was closer to one percent. Yeah. Um, so PS5 pre-orders went up, they were live for 20 minutes. And then when the dust settled, like, you know, people that clicked on IGN links and, you know, got through their checkout and we were able to help them. We sold about 1% as many PS5 digitals and, um, mm-hmm. as we did PS5 with discs. And so maybe that's a reflection of our audience more than like the total volume that was available. Maybe our audience was looking for the higher end system, but, um, I, I think it was just to have that lower entry price point. Yeah, you could be right, because when we poll our audience about like which version they're more interested in, it's more like an 80-20 split, right? It's not yeah, 99% of respondents say they're getting the disc version. Yep. Yep. Um, okay, we do have another uh, email from Adam Garnett about pre-orders. He says, I have secured a pre-order of an Xbox Series X. Truth be told, I think I would rather have a PS5 with the disc instead. Is there a way to trade pre-orders with someone <laughs> feeling the same and wanting to swap their PS5 pre-order with an Xbox pre-order? Clearly, you can sell it on eBay at a markup to afford the markup on a PS5, but that isn't how I would want to do it by ripping off others. I don't know if there was a community somewhere for this type of situation. Uh, and Adam Gardner, I guess I would just point you to the uh, GameScoop fan group on Facebook 
there might be someone in there that would like to trade a pre-order with you. Although I, you'd have to each get your console and then mail them to each other, right? So it'd be more of a friendly agreement, I guess. I mean, it would be Craigslist, right? That's scarier. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yes. I did see a stat that um, PS5 you know, pre-orders on eBay are going for an average of $700. So That's a re- this is a really good idea, though. I'm intrigued by this. I really, I always really like the questions we get from our readers every week. They're the best, or listeners, I should say. I'm not um, a fan. <laughs> I just don't care for them. Um, <laughs> uh, no, that's a really intriguing idea. Some aftermarket, like, look, no money needs to exchange hands. These are equivalent products. Like, does anybody want to trade? Like, I think that that's a good idea. We should have done that for Hack yeah, Week. It reminds hmm. me of my uh, World of Warcraft days where you go for like the look for group and there's like websites dedicated to this kind of thing. I bet you hmm. there probably is one we just don't know of. I got to let yeah. my cat out. We had a, um, uh, on the Nintendo voice chat group, there was a spinoff group just for Amiibo. And so it was about hmm. like, you know, uh, people were, were covering pre-order stuff. And then when things came out, we did trades. And I traded with a bunch of our uh, our fans, and it was really, really helpful. So I can vouch for uh, the Facebook fan groups being a good place to trade stuff like that. Yeah, a bunch of IGN staff members are doing the same. Like, we got consoles for each other. People are swapping deals mm-hmm. for each other. The buddy Absolutely. system, everybody. Yep. Um there's there's a concept can you hear me i had to take my yep. headset off yeah. um okay. i use board game geek a lot which is a big board gaming community and they do math trades there where sometimes it can be hard to find someone like i have this game i want to get rid of and i want this game in return and like you can't find a match they can't match you up with somebody but they end up matching you with someone like it goes in a circle like i send my game to this guy and he sends his game to that guy and then after three or four trades like then it gets around to like these eight people all need to trade a game and then I can get the game that I want. Hmm. And so like, that's just an interesting spin on this too. Like a, a way to trade things where it's hard to find, like it's hard to barter the exact item sometimes. Hmm. What is the name of the service? Well, it's just boardgamegeek.com, but okay, then, gotcha. you know, math trades are just something that, you know, that, that happens within that community. Hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Let's share what we've been playing. Sam, I know you're excited to play Super Mario 3 All-Stars. Yeah, I was really excited to play it, and I've only really been playing that. So I tried them all on my my Switch and then on my uh, TV screen, and they all look great on them. I have no problems with how they look. Uh, w- one thing that's really funny is that they each have their own, own menu systems from back in the day, and it's so cute seeing the Wii uh era menus because i don't know if you guys remember but it was like a white screen and then it always has like a little like oval button and you'd put your you'd put the cursor over like you'd have to aim the wii remote at the screen and choose everything so now that's touch controls and then everything in galaxy is like you know if you have to like you know uh in that game you'd point at the screen and gather a bunch of star bits right so like Mm -hmm. All that stuff is just like you kind of just like it's best for handheld because you just sit there and you, and you put your finger all over the screen and then you gather everything. So that's all there. I thought that was fun. Uh, I'm playing the most of Galaxy and it's my least favorite game in it, but I'm playing it because it's really relaxing and mm-hmm. uh, it's very easy. And I think that game has uh, oh it, that that game has probably the most amount of things that should have been fixed in it. Uh, I know Sunshine's famous for its pachinko level and it's a couple other things which are really terrible, but this game's motion control levels. Oh my goodness, they're bad. There's these ones. Do you remember remember the uh the the ray surfing? You're like on a manta ray and you're like on this like puddle of water that you can that you can fall off either side and then you have to like yeah. precariously and then there's also one where Mario's on a monkey ball and like the monkey ball has to roll to like a goal at the end. All those are controlled with motion controls and they still are. And so you're doing like switch handheld mode and you're doing that. And some of them you like touch your screen and like move near them. It, it's just it's just comical because those are like the most stressful parts of that game and they were hard for the wrong ways right they were just like please let me just be done with this level so they didn't fix those at all or anything and that's the big flaw with that game hmm. and then the other two the, the, the only thing i have to really report is again like it's funny seeing the the rough stuff that's left in um in mario sunshine when when you watch the intro and they do like hey press the press the x button they just mute x the word x <laughs> <laughs> the, the character flood is going like, all right, Mario, for this, hold the button. And then what? that's what that's what they did. <laughs> they should have like put in hold the right trigger. Button. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they don't even do that. Why they is just, it? That's like a, this should be a news story. They just mute it. 
That's amazing. Yeah, I was shocked. I forgot. I forgot about that till just now, but that was really funny. So yeah, there's all this cheapness to it. And also I wanted to mention to you, like Mario moves. I, I always think of Mario as like moving the same since like Mario 64, mm-hmm. but Mario Sunshine is so twitchy and fast and crazy feeling. I love it. I think it feels mm-hmm. so cool. And Mario like, turns around on a dime and he seems to move really fast and everything. And, and, and then other games, it's just a little bit different feeling, but having so much fun just you know lying in bed playing mario games it's awesome feels great i elected not to pick it up yet but well you know maybe like next uh february when it's about to you know not about to go off sale, maybe i'll yeah. maybe i'll feel like grabbing it <laughs> just you you played through mario 64 was it earlier this year yes so did you pick up 3d all-stars or did you not feel the need no i i, I think i described it as rude on this show a week yeah. or two ago and i stand yeah. by that um the reality is that over Christmas break or sometime, I'm in a moment of weakness. I'm absolutely yeah. going to end up buying it. But um, yeah. so far, I'm staying strong. Um, we have an email about Super Mario 3D All-Stars from Ryan in Detroit. It says, hey, Scoop Crew, long time, first time. I've been digging into Mario 3D All-Stars for the past week. And overall, I'm really enjoying it. But I'm definitely spending more time with Sunshine and Galaxy, as I don't think 64 has held up nearly as well over the years. I agree with a lot of the opinions you guys had over the past few weeks that Nintendo could have put a little more effort into this by fixing up some of the controls, graphics, and camera systems. But hey, why should they? This is selling gangbusters. Anyways, when it comes to Nintendo, I've always been more of a Zelda guy. And with Zelda's 35th anniversary next year and the rumors of that Skyward Sword port, it got me thinking of what Nintendo might have in store as it would only make sense after this Mario celebration and the Switch lacking past Zelda games. I'd like to get the Scoop Cruise wish list for what they'd like to see next year, and also what they think Nintendo will actually do since their offerings are rarely in line with our wishes. I've seen a lot of jokes about that. I have a, I have a Mario rant that'll be short that I have to do before this. Okay. He, he brought this up. Mario 64, the, the criticism of Mario 64 is that the camera is bad, right? Yeah, yes. I think That's... that camera is the most amazing piece of technology, and it's, a, it's incredible. Nobody on Earth had solved camera problems and in video games before that. And that game is so playable and so speed runnable and so amazing that you can like move Mario around a 3D environment and not think about the camera until it annoys you because you want to control the camera. That that camera is doing all the control for you. And every single piece of that game Mario is touching, the the you know Lakitu or Lakitu is is you know in the corner with the camera. Like what a brilliant way to describe how to move around in 3D environments. That's my rant. I would agree it was brilliant for the time, but you know, now I'm like, we're so used to having full control of the camera. I just like, you know, I'm not a game developer, but if (laughs) Nintendo could have gone in there and added that, I would have been very, very grateful. And you'd see some pretty funny parts of that castle. uh, That's right. If they have full camera control. (laughs) Maybe. Uh, as for uh, Zelda's 35th anniversary, I think uh, an Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, like sort of like H, you know, maybe not in HD, but well, it's just sort of a rematch. Uh, Ocarina of Time, that were Majora's on Mask, collect, you know, uh, mm-hmm. re, uh, upscaled collection, I think would be really good. So those, those games are kind of a pair, right? Yep. Yeah. No, I mean, but it'll probably be like Ocarina and like Twilight Princess and then Minish Cap <laughs> because that's what <laughs> Nintendo is now. Like it doesn't, it's not going to make any sense. Yeah, I think they're more likely to take on the uh, the the contemporary after 2000s games. And I, you know, there's already rumors about Skyward Sword and stuff like that. But like what what I want would be the uh, big open world games to get that Wind Waker treatment where it's like, oh, you know, we need to make the boat faster. And, and uh, you know, here's a here's here's a really nice up version of it. I think Twilight Princess is. Uh, reissue that happened already like could didn't even have that many tweaks like it should have seriously condensed uh, intro and stuff like that those games would be so fun if they just added in a place where you could hop in saves like i would love mm-hmm. that i would love to start halfway through skyward uh, sword or halfway through wind waker because i'm sick of playing the intros of those so much that i played them a lot and then dropped off and i never get to play the ends of those games anymore because i try to return to them and like i don't have time to finish this I'd love to play the ends of those games. That's my wish list. That's pretty good. Well, yeah. Go ahead, Gina. I was just going to say, if you want to know what Nintendo's actually going to do, you just look at what their big upcoming anniversaries are because they love celebrating. So it's going to be something related to whatever the next big one is, which I don't know off the top of my head. Well, the next one is Zelda. 
Well, then there you go. Next year. So 35. And then uh, probably Luigi's having a birthday, too, that they're going to spend a year celebrating. We already had a year of Luigi. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, well, that's true. He's going to turn 40. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Remember Link's crossbow training? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was thinking about this. Justin, what do you think about Link's Ring Fit Adventure? I think think that's actually kind of a brilliant idea. Thank you. Thank you. What about if it was a um, That was one of our game scope games, I remember. Yeah. Uh, crossbow training, yeah, mm-hmm. that was uh, taking the other Oracle games and putting them in the Link's Awakening graphics would be really cute. Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be awesome. And then also just like a survey of handheld Zelda games that went through all of them, including the uh, the Spirit Tracks era games, it would be really cute too. Like Phantom Hourglass, mm-hmm. yeah, those games need a second ch- shot. Mm-hmm. Um, I do want to clarify. I actually don't think Nintendo should be, you know, remaking or redoing. Like, I don't want Super Mario 64 done in a 2020 graphical style. And, like, that seems to be what Nintendo really dislikes. Like, I think back to Mario All-Stars where they took their 8-bit games and then gave us 16-bit versions of them. They're like, look, it's the newest, best-looking version of Mario. Like, we remade them. But now, another 20 or 30 years later, now those are just old remakes. So I don't want them bringing the games up contemporary to 2020. I just want them doing... Like, just make it widescreen and make it higher res. Like, yeah. I don't think they should muck with the camera, and I don't think that they should redo the graphics or redo anything. It's like, just bring it to a state where it's just it's they're just in better shape than they are now. Like, they really did less than the bare minimum to get them out the door. Not less than, but they did do the bare minimum. So, Ocarina yeah. and Majora got those 3DS remakes, and I, I did yeah. like them at the time, but, like, those those might scale up um, better than the originals because they're rounder. But I don't know if I'd just like you're saying, I don't know if I'd prefer that. Um, they did, those are cool though. Those the, like the master quest inclusion for Ocarina was awesome. I did that start to finish hundred percent. All the skull I, chulas. I know I've brought it up on this show before, but I think it's so weird that there's a different version of Mario 64 on the DS. Yeah. Like yeah. it's one, it's one of the most iconic games of all time. And now N- Nintendo clearly wants to like, you know, cl- like, don't think about that. Like they've put it in the vault. Like it has more stars. Like there's a version of one of the greatest, most beloved games of all time that has more stars that like, we're probably never going to see again. That ruined yeah. our strategy guide. I had to redo that from scratch over the past couple of weeks. You could play as yeah. Wario. <laughs> it was <Yeah>. insane. <laughs> Uh, okay, I want to talk about Hades, but I know that Tina has a hard out in five minutes, and I oh, want no. to get her opinion on uh, another email first. So we're going to jump around here. This is Austin from Charlotte, North Carolina. It says, since 2015, I've looked forward to my morning scoop and coffee every Saturday morning. Following the reveals of the new generation of consoles, I found myself thinking more about the design of the consoles more than ever before. The last console design that I recall having a particular affinity for was the Xbox 360. Anyway, my question for the chief scoop officer and the rest of the board of scoopers is this what are the best and worst console designs throughout the years keep on dishing out those refreshing scoops for us to pour all over our faces thinking about this recently um but the ps5 i actually think is pretty horribly designed especially because i'm in the um i'm in the market for new furniture having just moved and so i'm looking at media console tables specifically um and nothing fits that thing at least standing when you're talking about shelving and i've even looked at units with movable shelving and it's still just so tough so inevitably i'll have this thing laying flat which i may or may not have decided to do on my own but i kind of don't have a choice if i want to make sure that it goes in the cabinet rather than just sitting on top of it next to a tv or whatever else yeah so i would say for for one of the ugliest at least since it's top of mind ps5 for sure and alternatively (laughs) ps4 i love that like slanted design it reminds me of a building in san francisco that i don't know the name of Mm -hmm. yeah i would i would agree with both of those assessments are you talking about the transamerica the pyramid no, it's no, a, there's a building over by Embarcadero. I know exactly oh, what you're okay. talking about. <laughs> like, Embarcadero, that would be yeah. a cool console shape. <laughs> I think there's actually two of them, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I definitely think console designs have regressed. The, P- the Xbox and the PS- PlayStation are both worse looking than the previous gen, where they'd really kind of figured it out. They had sleek, attractive, visually appealing consoles. Um, I was never a fan of the quirky era. Like I, you know, I'm a huge fan of the GameCube, but not its design. Like I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't care for that. Um, it has a handle. Yeah, and like e- even also the, SNES, the name, it, name don't lie. 
<laughs> and like SNES. You gotta give it that. <laughs> I think I think that I think the Xbox One X may be like one of the best looking consoles in the That's PS4. The like, small white. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that one's that one's attractive. I think the coolest looking console of all time is the Sega Genesis. Oh. It look oh it looks awesome. It looks so like rad. Late eighties black and red. Oh, that marketing really got you. Oh yeah, man. <laughs> and I was a Nintendo. I don't kid. know, it strikes me as so funny. <laughs> uh, so anything cool. atomic purple is my favorite. Oh, the clear so uh Nintendo sixty four purple was <laughs> really cool. That was a really cool one. Yeah. Um yeah. Uh, my favorite console design is, I guess, the Vectrex. I never think about this. The Vectrex is very cool. Yeah, uh, it's a, it has a built-in screen, so it looks like a tiny black television, uh, but it has, you know, vector graphics and looks ridiculous. Um, I think all consoles are s- just completely silly looking, and they're all, like, tied to the marketing of their time, and they all look so outdated so quickly. Uh, handhelds, on the other hand, are lovely and sleek and wonderful, and the DS Lite is probably takes my, uh, mm. takes my place yeah. for number one. I was going to say DS Lite 2 or maybe GBA SP. Yeah. yeah. Both now, of those one, are great. Thinking back, I think the Xbox 360 is one of the ugliest systems ever made. And I, I didn't mind well, it originally. I never thought about it. But now I look at it, I'm like, what a dumb toy piece of crap that looks like. <laughs> but th- that one got a redesign that looks much yeah. nicer. <laughs> it was all right. The okay. C3PO one was cute. Yeah, they had a bunch of skins, too. I had the yeah. Gears of War one. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and then the, yeah, I think the Wii was funny because it could look really sleek and everything, but it just ended up as a little dusty rectangle with a door <laughs> turn out, t- torn off of it. So you can plug your GameCube controllers into it. <laughs> the, the red Wii was really cool. Yeah, that came and went really fast. Yeah. Won't see that again. All right, Tina, do we need to let you go? I can give you 15 more minutes. Oh, oh, perfect. Wow, that's 20 questions. That should, questions be, enough that should <laughs> be enough time. That should be enough time. Justin, are you also playing Hades? Yeah, dude, Hades is so good. I am playing so Hades good. as well. And it's great. Uh, Super Giant has never made a bad game. They've never let me down. And um, and I actually double dipped. I have that game on PC, and then I got it on Switch, and it runs really flawlessly. It's great on the Switch. Yeah, I'm playing on Switch. Nice. My, only, <clears throat> my only gripe is that the text is very small. A little hard to read sometimes, but that, yeah. that's it. Awesome it's game. Common video game problem. Yeah. Do you call Kingo to come read the text for you? What does this say? <laughs> he's not gonna. He's not gonna be able to help me for a while. <laughs> um, yeah. If you guys haven't, you've surely you've heard people talking about Hades, but you, if you don't know what it's all about, uh, it's a you know super giant action combat style game, but in a roguelike setting where you're the son of Hades trying to escape hell. So you go on runs, uh, make it as far as you can. Lots of uh, fast, fluid combat with enemies and boss fights, but everything is remixed, so it's different every time you go. But people are really taken with like the characters and the presentation. In between each run, they're able to fit in some uh, storytelling and some character interaction and world building. So it makes it feel a little bit less repetitive, I think. But the combat feels great. Uh, it's got a really cool style. The voice acting is really good, just like all Supergiant games. It's great. It's great. I'm really enjoying it. A lot of people are saying it's like game of the year material. I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that yet. Justin, I don't know, I don't know about you. Mm, I like Spirit Fair a little more, but this game is definitely it's great. Yeah, it's really really good. Remember, um, game of the year is very very much influenced uh, by what comes out after September. <laughs> <laughs> we, we that's why we do game what of the year watch and after we September Cyberpunk. Yeah, Cyberpunk exactly. But this game is is an example of that, um, and that's what clouds your 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 memory of the year too. I mean, like when you asked us the other day what our games of the year were, I yeah. completely forgot that Animal Crossing is my game of the year. Like it's like yeah. I have no question. Like there's just no mm-hmm. there's no cultural force even approaching Animal Crossing for playing with friends and 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 you know just like being stuck at home and having to like live like outdoors only through this game. Like that game had so much profound meaning for me that like i can't imagine something beating it but but cyberpunk will you know yeah well we'll see um <clears throat> i've seen a lot of people saying uh they like hades even though it's a roguelike or they don't normally like roguelikes roguelikes but they like hades and i don't understand wh- why someone would just dismiss the roguelike genre 
Entirely. Uh, it's what you're talking about Spelunky, right? It's because they're stressful. They're scary. Well, and I only like I only like roguelikes that have permanent progression systems. Otherwise, and I know if they don't have a permanent progression system, the progression system is your skill and familiarity with the game and its enemies. But mm-hmm. that's a that's sort of a lie. <laughs> like there's no, like no no no. So that's why I like Hades so that's much. Pac-Man's it's got, progressive system. Yeah, that's every. Yeah, you just described <laughs> video games. Um, <laughs> No, what I like about Hades is that there is all kinds of meta systems where I'm unlocking weapons and leveling up my character and getting stronger in different ways. Like I feel like I'm making progress on like six or eight parallel paths all the time. And so that's that what feels, feels really good about it to me. But you know, in a game like Splunky, there's no there's no progress that carries on. You you start from zero every single run. And I guess I don't understand the not liking that because games, the concept of a game, not just video games, but games. Uh, have existed as long as human beings have, as long as, you know, even animals play games. And like, it was, it's only video games where this idea of, uh, I only, I'm going to play this game one time and then never play it again. Like that's a very, very recent idea. I play video games just to see bars fill up. That's (laughs) what I'm here for. But it's like, you also play board games. You play board games where... After you're done playing, you pack everything up and put it away. And then when you get the board game out again, you start from scratch again. That's a good point. And like, that's what a roguelike is like. That's what like football and baseball and basketball are like. It's the same yeah. game it's, that it's so, you play over and over again. So wait, so is soccer a roguelike? Because each time you play, you have more knowledge of the of skills and you or, get a little bit better. Or you're in a different, you're in a different, I don't know, arena. Uh, mm-hmm. The crowd is different. Maybe <laughs> different players on your teams. Yeah, stuff is remixed. But so also- I don't understand why like... This concept of like, I only like games where I'm just going to play through them one time and never play them again. But with board games and with sports games, you could you could also make the argument that there's a huge social aspect to it. And like, that's sort of the reason well, sure. for busting out that board game or <clears throat> going and attending and watching a sports game. And then there's the the angle of following characters, too. So there's a level of celebrity done when it comes exactly. to sports games, too. That's so the storyline that, that roguelikes are missing, right? Yeah, Exactly. That's, that's a really good point. So if you like story and social interaction, then roguelikes are bad for you. Also, roguelikes take out the high score system in a lot of ways, not not Spelunky. Um, but uh, sometimes they don't even have that. So it's like, you know, when you're an arcade game is technically like, a, you know, if it's not too repetitive, it'd be like a roguelike. Um, it's I mean, I know the difference. Trust me. Uh, but I'm just saying they have a high scoreboard and that's the social interaction, right? You're competing sure. with other people to get further. Those are good points, but I will say people play solitaire more than once. Let's play it over and over again. Anyway, that's just my little roguelike rant. That brings us... You don't normally have rants. I like that. Mm -hmm. I just really love roguelikes. (laughs) That brings us to Video Game 20 Questions. Our suggestion this week comes from Ryan from Detroit. That's right, the same Ryan from Detroit that we heard from earlier. And what did he ask about? He, ha- he, he was asking about uh, what we want um, from the Zelda's 35th okay. anniversary celebration. Was this game made by published by Nintendo? No. Oh, man. Is this game a roguelike? No. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta keep it on theme. <laughs> Has Nintendo ever made a roguelike? Oh, yeah. This, well, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. Nice. Uh, but that's not developed by them. But no. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, that would be Pokemon Company. Never mind. Um, Okay, reset. Did, did this game come out before January 1st, 2000? Yes. Is it from after 1990? Yes. Uh, is it a 3D game? No, that's five. And he did didn't even game... have to think about it. Did this game originally release on a 16-bit console? Yes. Uh, is, it, is it a platformer? No. Is it an RPG? No. Was this game developed in the United States? No. Uh, Was this a... uh, Wait, so it's 16-bit. Was this a... Was was this a platform exclusive? Yes, that's 10. Was it Jenny? Yeah. Was it Jenny? Was it Jenny? Yeah, was it for the Sega Jenny? That's what they call it in Europe. <laughs> that, that, that's not a thing. 
Yes, it what? is a thing. And first of all, series is not a thing, so don't call me on the Jenny. Drakwe <laughs> and Jenny are real thing. You're asking if this game was on the Sega Genesis? Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> I hope it was the Super Nintendo, because we only specified 16-bit console. Damon's going to come back and tell us the Atari Lynx was 16-bit or something I insane know. Like well, that. and the Turbo Graphics. That's a good... Okay, so we got to... Okay, yeah. Okay, was this an SNES game? SNES exclusive? Yes. I hate having to spend a question on that, but we can't. Do we it... ask? Do we ask if it was made in Japan or no. some other version of you, that? We asked U.S. and he said no. Was it made in Japan? Yes. Company still around? Which company is the company that? Oh God! Developer publisher? Is the pub, I guess it's the publisher still around? Yes. Okay. That's the easier one. That means the developer is not around. Yeah. Potentially. So Capcom Konami. Are they still within like the modern era making entries? Is this game franchise? Why am I asking this in such a weird way? Are they still making sequels to this game? Uh, in you know, there was. Well, oh, hold on. So potentially spinoffs. Hold on, hold on. Are they still making sequels to this game? Uh, no, well, I okay. My is go-to there's... question is always: Is this part of a franchise? Is this part of a franchise that is still active today? Yes. That's 15. But it's active, not an RPG. Act, active as of this generation. Not an I think RPG. It might be, I think it might be Contra 3 The Alien Wars. <laughs> that's a good, it's an SNES exclusive that's not made by Nintendo, made in Japan, so there's not that many. As of this generation. Yeah, because Damon and, and I played a terrible Contra game in this generation. Oof. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's a, really, that's a really good guess. I mean, do you want to ask developer? Do you shoot guns in this game? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I guess I would need to know developer, but we, we now know that it's not a platformer or a shooty game. Which I mean, RPG. I mean, is it or technically RPG, a, yeah. is it technically a gun in Mega Man? Is your Mega Blaster a gun? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, Damon, you would count that as a gun, right? Sure. <laughs> is that is that your question? No, <laughs> Would I no count? you can't count that one. <laughs> I don't know. Was I, this I said game made by Capcom? Game. Was this game made by Capcom? No. Was it made by Konami? No. Okay. We got one more question we have to guess? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> I thought it might be Super Castlevania. Sorry, I burned two questions back to back. So... If it's not Capcom or Konami and the company is still around publishing games, mm -hmm. it could be Square or Enix. But it's not an RPG. It's not a shooty and it's not a platform game. So mm -hmm. some sort of brawler fighting mm -hmm. game potentially. Yeah, yeah, that's a good call. Brawler yeah. or sport. That is a good yeah. call. I guess it could be Tecmo out of the field. Around. Koei and Tecmo are made Super Nintendo games. But either Stratton. way, we're not getting this in one question anyway. <laughs> if it's Koei, it could be like Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Yeah, for sure. Or Nobunaga's ambition. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. Do, do, do you think we should go some direction or should we just give up, Damon? Well, you, I think you should ask Another the question, question and then yes. And then give up. But I don't have uh, a yeah. high... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't have a lot of faith. Yeah, no one does here. <laughs> but if we nail the genre, should, we should ask if it's sport, puzzle, strategy. One of those things could give us the win. Yeah, it could be puzzle. Are there exclusive SNES puzzle games that were made in Japan? Uh, would, who made Tetris Attack? No, that, that I mean, Nintendo published that. Here's, oh. here's, here's a hint. There's a very useful question that you ask sometimes that you have not asked. That we, we mentioned this game? this game? Oh, no, that wasn't my, um, <laughs> that wasn't it. But no, you haven't mentioned it. Okay. Um, that, that was a question. We oh, does it have snow in it? <laughs> yeah. Is that the question? I no, was meaning, sure. I was meaning, well, I'm not going to. Like I'll a classic you a question that we Okay. Have. Do you want to guess a game or should I reveal? I want to guess a game because I want to have one more question and then guess the game. No, well, we you're just out of questions. Yeah. What was the question? And have we have mentioned you mentioned the game? The game? Oh, but I feel what like we were say? just asking if that was the question that you had in mind that we would be asking. Not that we were actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Since since we're so far off the mark here. <laughs> sure. We're not going to get it even if you give it. What's three. the question that we would normally ask? There's a very useful be, question that, that gets you to hone in on it that you have not asked. So that I, would be... 
all three of us when you said that, Damon, <laughs> thought that it was the have we mentioned this game question. Well, that's well, how about this? How about this? Is it on Switch? Is it that one you think? No. I, I, why not? That's a really good one. It's got to yeah. be one that we use frequently, which is why we all guess the have we mentioned this game one yet. The Switch one we use frequently. We do use that frequently. Mm-hmm. Borba suggesting. I know the games on the Switch Virtual Console. Borba said maybe we should ask if it's a Damey game. Oh yeah, I don't, know. Cool. I don't know how much that would help me. We do often ask, "Is this well received?" Oh yeah, is it well received? That's that's it. I think that's the one to go with. But is that really going to help us narrow it down? But sure. maybe it's maybe it's a bomb. Maybe it's horrible. That's yeah. not the question I was thinking of. But okay. you know, it's your yeah. question. Ask whichever you guys want. I, this I, is so much more than twenty <laughs> questions now. We lost again. Hey, Kitty. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it, what, is this on switch? No. <laughs> okay. So then I think the game is, oh, I bet I knew what the question is. Is, is this licensed? That was the question. So it's a licensed game. Um, Aladdin, and, uh, Aladdin for the SNES. Do it. Wait, no, that no, was, not, uh, it got us to be de- de- designed in Japan. That's yeah. Capcom. Yeah. But we already asked about Capcom. She said no. Yeah. 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 So I think this is, um, castle of illusion. But those are not developed in the United States, right? Or were they? That's a Genesis game. Or the other one, sorry. The SNES one. I don't know it. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. There's there's also movie games from the time. And But also remember that he said that it was made relevant again this generation. So a license that came out this generation. Yeah. What's that about? What? There's things around. There's things around like that, you know? Ren and Stimpy gets rebooted. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, G.I. Joe? No, that wouldn't be it. I don't know. I guess we're just... Okay. Is it, is it a Godzilla? Maybe it's a Godzilla game. Yeah. I was just... Uh, I don't know. my the, time over here. I don't know what the fighting just, Godzilla game is I don't know. for I don't know uh, Super either. Nintendo, but I don't think we got it, because I, I wouldn't be able to... Is it called... Um, <laughs> Godzilla King of the Monsters or Fighting Godzilla or something. <laughs> it's a Godzilla fighting game, I think. Anyway, we won't get it. What is it, Damon? Uh, it is Super Godzilla. Oh. Wow. I've never even, I didn't, I don't know that title off the top of my head. Super oh, Godzilla, okay. 1994, kind of a hybrid. Uh, you maneuver Godzilla around an overhead map, and then when he runs into another monster, there's kind of a fighting game happening. Okay. That's what I remember is the screenshots from Nintendo Power for that fighting game part. Yeah. Is Ultraman in it? Uh, it wouldn't be Ultraman. Oh, Jet Jaguar is the robot that looks Jet like Ultraman. Jet Jaguar. Okay. Yeah. Yes. There you go. That was a really hard mode one. Yeah. Was I love how we went through our gamut of commonly asked questions and what would be helpful, though. That was great. Yeah. The, it was the license one I was thinking of. However, yeah. Toho published that game and Toho oh. owns Godzilla. So in that case, I guess it's not licensed. But I think, you know, still. Oh, well, yeah. It's based on a, I guess, entertainment license is what we would say. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It was developed by Advanced Communication Company. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I gonna love guess, the conference every year. Which I'm going to guess is not still in business today. Or if they yeah. are, they're making telephones or something. Yeah. And there was a uh, 2015 PS4 Godzilla game. That's right. Which was bad. I remember, I remember checking it out at your desk. It's also bad. Uh, Tina, we've kept you for 16 minutes. So sorry if you were, if we are making you late for something. But that is all the scoops that we have for you this week. Remember, you can always reach us at the email address, gamescoop at IGN.com. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Sam. Thank you to Borba. Working behind the scenes. My name is Damon. This is IGN Gamescoop. And we're out.